I'll meet you now in Jonah 4 in just a minute. But before I do, I have to uh, say something to you, and you can't judge me for it. It's this. I do not like to go look at Christmas lights. Is that, yeah, you with me, Debbie G? Okay. She's like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Here, here's the thing. Before you judge me and call me Ebenezer Scrooge, I like Christmas, okay? I'm into Christmas. I like that Jesus was born. I like the food. I like the family. I like the holiday. I like the songs. Love the music. I love everything about Christmas. And I even like Christmas lights. I don't have any problem with Christmas lights. I've got some on my house when I'm driving down the road. I love it. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand setting aside time to get in the car and go on a trip to see things that I will otherwise see every single time I get in the car. I just don't get the, I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, the other thing that historically I have not been super pumped about, don't really understand why people are so jazzed about it, is the zoo. So like going to the zoo, it's, you know, it's great. There's animals there. I'm there for like five minutes. I'm like, can we go home now? Okay, we've seen all the animals. Great, let's go. I don't really get it. Now, you might imagine that because of these two general distastes that my favorite night of the entire calendar year is when my family goes to zoo lights. (laughs) Praise the Lord. My two favorite things in one day. Amazing. Zoo lights. Now, I go to zoo lights. Do you know why? Because I have children. (laughs) And one year, when we went to zoo lights, this was like two or three years ago, we were were sitting in an hour-long line, not not just to get into zoo lights, but to get a parking spot for zoo lights. So we're in the car just like shuffling along, waiting for a parking spot, and we didn't realize at the time one of our kids was sick and about to be a lot sicker. We're sitting in the car. This kid, while we're still waiting for a parking spot, poops his pants in my car. And so I'm trying to, we're like, it's, it's horrible. It's awful in our car. We're trying to like figure this whole thing out. And then we get into our parking space and we go into the park and 20 minutes later, same kid pukes his guts out. So he's like totally sick. And we're like, this day is over. <laughs> we just packed everything up. We went back to our car and we left. And here's, here's the amazing thing. We went back the next year. And do you know why I went back the next year? And, and I, did, I never complained. I went with joy, and I will go again this fall. Do you know why? Because when you love someone, you learn to love what they love. If it was me, alone by myself, I ain't going to zoo lights. But I have children, and they love zoo lights. And when you love someone, you learn to love what they love. And if you love God you should love what God loves, right? Like what you value, what you care about, what you're moved by, what is in your heart should be in alignment with what's in God's heart. You should love what God loves. And this is why we need Jonah chapter four, because Jonah is a master class in chapter four of how not to love what God loves. Sometimes in the Bible, you look at people and you're like, oh, there's a, gr- there's a great example. We should do that. And then you read Jonah four and you're like, yeah, we should definitely do the opposite of that. Whatever that is, we should not do that. That's what Jonah is. He's like a foil. He's a negative example because what he shows you in chapter four is that his heart is like a million miles away from the heart of God. The things that God makes, makes God happy makes Jonah angry. The things that makes God heart, God's heart break makes Jonah rejoice. Jonah is a million miles from the heart of God. But here's the wonder of Jonah 4 and the wonder of the entire book of Jonah is that even when Jonah is immature and sinful and selfish and ridiculous, God still loves him and pursues him. This is what's so good about God. We've been learning in, the God, in, in Jonah, in this prophetic book, that he is the God who pursues. And what we're going to see with so much clarity and power in chapter 4 is that God patiently pursues his people even when they don't share his heart. God patiently pursues his people even when they don't share his heart. Because here's the deal. It'd be really easy for you and me to read Jonah 4 and look at him and be like, what an idiot. This guy doesn't get it. Are you serious, buddy? You're not tracking by now? And it would be really easy for us to kind of like dismiss him and look down on him with condescending judgment and forget to realize that we are way more like Jonah than we would like to admit. We are way more like Jonah than feels comfortable for us to acknowledge. 
There are often times that our heart is just out of alignment with the heart of God. Things that God cares about, we're indifferent towards. Things that God is moved by, we could not care less about. We find ourselves out of sync, out of harmony, out of alignment with the heart of God, but praise his grace that he doesn't abandon us there. He doesn't say, oh, you're out of alignment? Fine. You can just go do your own thing. I'm leaving you. I'm abandoning you. I'm moving on. What does he do? He patiently and kindly and lovingly continues to pursue his people. And his pursuit is actually what brings us back into alignment with him. This is so good. This is desperately needed, not just for dumb people like Jonah, but for people like you and me, people who struggle, people who are sinful, people who get out of the will of God. We need him to pursue us even when we don't share his heart. So, Jonah 4, verse 1. Let's see the way that God pursues Jonah, and we will learn the way that God pursues us. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Verse five, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. He asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But Jonah, but God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into, a, in, in, into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Cows, huh? Interesting end. It's like the ending without an ending. It's like the cliffhanger. It, everything about chapter four is like jarring and weird. And it's kind of supposed to be that way, I think, because Jonah at the end of chapter three is like, it's completed the perfect story arc. It's amazing. Like, you know, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and there's the rising action where he runs away and disobeys. And then there's the storm and the waves and he gets thrown overboard and the fish and then he gets vomited out. He gets a second chance, turns to God. He goes to Nineveh and he proclaims this message. And through his message, God saves the city, showers grace upon the inhabitants of Nineveh and relents from the disaster that he intended to do. And it's like, oh, that's awesome. Credits roll, curtain drops, story over, happily ever after. And then Jonah 4, like this weird little, I like to call it like a post credit scene. You know, when like the credits roll and then you get this, like after the credits, you get this glimpse into something else that was going on. It's like this little epilogue where Jonah finds himself in a place where his heart is radically and woefully out of sync with the heart of God. And yet God is still patiently right there with him teaching him, training him, and lovingly calling him back to his heart. So when you and I do not share the heart of God, which sometimes we're not even likely to be aware that we don't share the heart of God. When we don't share the heart of God, the question is, what will he do for us? How will he pursue us? And I'd like to present to you that he will pursue you the same way that he pursued Jonah 
And it'll be in three ways. Here's the first one. God pursues me when, number one, he confronts my ridiculous rage. He confronts my ridiculous rage. Jonah is, Jonah's big mad here. And we're about to see why. He's going to tell us very explicitly. Verse one says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. The original language says, it was evil to Jonah with great evil. He was not only angry about what happened, he thought that what happened was wrong, that it it was reprehensible, that it was bad, that it was evil. And so it says, and he was angry. Now, what is it? What displeased Jonah? Well, it's all of the events of chapter three. It's that he preached and all of Nineveh got saved by the mercy of God. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that God delights to show mercy. So if you made a list of things that make God happy, showering mercy on people and not giving them what they deserve would be high on the list. It makes God happy to give people mercy. But the irony that we see at the very beginning of chapter four is that what makes God happy makes Jonah very angry. God's like, isn't this amazing? And Jonah's like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened. This is, this is awful. This is terrible. This is wrong. And he's livid. He's, he's so angry that these people have received mercy. I read this week one commentator say, Jonah is frustrated to find that the time fuse does not work on the prophetic bomb that he dropped in Nineveh. He goes in there and he's like, 40 days and the city's going to be destroyed. And it didn't happen because of God's mercy. And it enrages him, likely for a whole host of reasons. Right? There's, there's likely inside of Jonah this nationalistic prejudice that is totally great with God giving mercy to the people of Israel, just not to those horrible, godless, pagan Assyrians. Not them. Anyone but them. There's likely a little bit of like self-protection because he's thinking, well, what if they turn back from God and then they go violent again and all of a sudden they come and ransack Israel and you could have wiped them out the whole time, God, but now they're going to destroy us. It's probably a little bit of social image concern where he's like, I said the city was going to be destroyed and then it wasn't. That, does that make me a liar? What's going on here? And then I wonder how much he's embarrassed because these Ninevites who didn't even know God at all before Jonah marched into their city are putting to shame the chosen people of God. Because while Jonah is while Jonah's experiencing this, the Ninevites have wholeheartedly turned to God in repentance and devotion, while the Israelites are rejecting God. So these, these godless pagans are putting to shame the covenant people of God. And Jonah's thinking that, well, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe this. This is horrible. Every reason that you could come up with for Jonah to be angry is ridiculous. But it is amplified in how ridiculous it is when you consider what Jonah says. Because what what we see here so clearly is that God always, only, and ever acts out of his character. So, So think with me here. Sometimes you're like, you know, I'm a punctual person, but sometimes I'm late. I'm a, I'm a kind person, but sometimes I say mean things. God never does that. God never acts in a way that is out of alignment with his character. God is perfectly loving, just, holy, good, merciful, faithful, and none of his actions are ever out of sync with that. He only ever acts out of his character. And what is so stunning about Jonah's anger here is that it is the fact that he knew God was like this, that he gets angry. Do you you notice what he says? He says, he prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That's Jonah's way of saying, I told you this was going to happen. I told you so, God. This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. This is his way of excusing himself, of justifying his disobedience to the clear command of God. This is why I didn't listen to you, God, because, and here's what he says, I knew you were like this. I knew this is what you were going to do. And 
Do you notice that when he says, I knew that you were, he quotes the most famous self-description of God that is repeated all throughout the scriptures and was given first to Moses after the Exodus. That God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And rather than that being a comfort to Jonah, that enrages Jonah. I knew that you were gracious I knew that you love to give things to people that they haven't earned. I knew that you were merciful, that you love to withhold what people have earned in their sin. I knew that you were slow to anger. I was really hoping you'd have a short fuse on this day, but you're so patient. I knew that you are filled, that you're overflowing with covenant-keeping, faithful, steadfast love. I knew that you were like that, and it makes me crazy. And, and here's why. Jonah is totally good, with himself being the recipient of those amazing attributes of God, he's just not good with them getting it, with someone else receiving this goodness from God. And what that means is that his anger is, it's ridiculous. God is acting according to his character. He's doing what he always does. He's being true to himself in the way that he's revealed himself, his character that doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jonah is enraged and God is going to confront him in this because he's so enraged that he wants to die. He's going to say this over and over again in this passage. He so despairs of life itself. He's so frustrated that he's like, I would just rather not exist. I would rather not even be alive if this is the way it's going to be. That's how deeply troubled he is by this. And rather than God doing what he could do, because like Jonah's really angry. And have you ever seen somebody be really angry and then someone's angry right back and then it just escalates and like it boils up out of control? Rather than God coming down on him hard with righteous anger, which he could do in response to Jonah's ridiculous anger, God instead just asked him a very calm question. <laughs> if you've ever had a toddler, you've pulled this move. He's just flying off into like a, a furious rage. And God says, do you do well to be angry? What he's asking Jonah to do is just like stop for a minute and let, hey, hey bud, let's think about this for a second. <laughs> let's try to work this through. You're mad that I am who I am. You're mad that I'm doing what I do. You are mad that someone else has benefited from the same grace that reached you and transformed you and saved you and spared you? Like, do you think that's a good thing? Do you think this is right? Now, the, the question, it, it's meant to lead Jonah, I think, to a moment of introspection. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem that it reaches Jonah that way. Because if Jonah just stopped for a second, you know, like if, if you're driving on the road and uh, someone cuts you off and you just like fly off the handle in a rage about how they cut you off and then someone says to you, oh, there's a child in that car with a severe allergic reaction and they need to get to the hospital. You'd probably be like, oh, I feel like an idiot. I probably shouldn't be as mad as I am right now. Yeah, please go ahead, go ahead, like you, you should go. What, what that would require is at least a moment of introspection. Is it right for me to be angry right now? Apparently, Jonah doesn't get there, as we'll see in just a second. But we certainly can. God gives us the opportunity as we peek into Jonah's ridiculous anger, like I said, not to dismiss Jonah and say, wow, what a fool. He's angry at what God is doing. I would never do that. But, but rather to ask ourselves to actually take a moment of introspection and say, where have I been angry when God is doing what God does? Because there's places in our lives when God is just being God. God is doing what God does and it makes us mad. How many times has God when we ask him repeatedly for something, God, this is something I want. God, this is something I need. And we go to him and I need it. And can, if you can give it to me right now. And God says, no. Or God says, not right now. And rather than saying, okay, God, that's a God thing for you to do. You're sovereign. You're in control. We rather are just filled with frustration and anger and bitterness that we don't get what we want right now. How about when God allows suffering into our lives? which is not out of his character, remember? God is not like, 
you know, I'll never suffer. He entered into suffering himself in Jesus Christ. He took death upon his own shoulders. So God is no stranger to using suffering for his glorious purposes. And yet sometimes when we're suffering, we think the only good thing God could do is make me stop suffering right now. When what God is doing is acting according to his character and what we're doing is just getting mad that he's doing it. So where in his loving pursuit of us does God need to confront us where our rage is just unfounded? Because God's being God. He's doing what God does. And I'm not saying that you should feel all kinds of positive emotions about difficult things in your life. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you need to be careful when you get into moments of bitterness and anger and frustration and rage that you don't direct that at God for God doing what God does. But rather, you should receive the loving confrontation of God when he asks a question like, do you do well to be angry? Is it good for you to be frustrated about this? And you would allow the spirit of God to lead you in that careful self-analysis. This is the pursuit of God. His patient pursuit of people who don't share his heart. Here's the, that's the first way. Here's the second. God not only confronts my ridiculous rage, number two, he exposes my stubborn selfishness. My stubborn selfishness. Jonah is very selfish and God is going to expose that and he does it in this really interesting way. Jonah uh, apparently doesn't answer the question. You know when you get asked a question and you're like, uh, checkmate. I have no answer to that question. You just, you're quiet. You just walk out of the room. Jonah apparently just walked away, didn't answer the question, probably didn't think about it much. And what he decided to do was go to the east side of the city, set up a little pop-up tent and sit down and watch to see what would happen to the city, the text says. Which, it doesn't really tell us why he did that, but it seems likely, at least at some level, that Jonah is harboring a hope that God will still destroy the city, like Sodom and Gomorrah style. So he goes out there, he's setting up his folding chair, and he's like, all right, maybe, just maybe, the Ninevites' repentance will be short-lived enough that God will still destroy them at the 40-day mark. And if it's going to happen, you better believe I'm going to be here to see it. And he's sitting out there, and he's just waiting to see what will happen. And even then, you see, God is right there with them. God doesn't just let them like walk away. He doesn't just let them go and say, fine, you just go do your own thing. He lovingly, patiently goes after him. And what he's going to do here in verses six to nine is he is going to exercise his sovereignty over creation to teach Jonah a lesson about how selfish he is. So one of, the, one of the features of the book of Jonah is that you see very clearly God's sovereignty over creation. God is hurling the wind. God is appointing the fish. God tells the fish to spit Jonah up onto the land. He's in sovereign control over everything in creation, and he's working it all together for his great purposes. And here, he is going to use a plant, a worm, and a wind to teach Jonah a lesson about how selfish he is. Look at verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. And then this phrase that is very important. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Verse seven, but when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. So it's not just big animals like a fish that can swallow a human. It's little animals like a, like a worm that crawl through the dirt. God appointed the worm to attack the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. So here's what's going on. Jonah was in a very hot environment. He's in the Middle East, in the desert. Um, I, I read a commentary this week that was like, oh, you know, in the Middle East, it can get up to like 110 degrees. And they said it was like big and scary. And I was like, Psh, amateur, you know, nothing. <laughs> You ever walk outside in August and you're like, do I live in a blow dryer? Is, is this okay? Like my face hurts. What's happening? That's the kind of heat we're talking about here. And so Jonah is uncomfortable. He's in the heat. 
And God causes a plant to rise up over Jonah so that he is comfortable in the shade. And here's what's so important about this. The only time in all of Jonah that he is even remotely recorded as having any sort of joy or delight is when he is comfortable in the shade. So God not only provides the plant to show him his selfishness, he takes the plant by making the worm eat it to double down on revealing just how selfish he is. Because when the shade comes up, Jonah's like fat and happy. In fact, verse one, if you could read it in the original, I told you it says, it was evil to Jonah with great evil. And then when he's rejoicing in the shade, it says he rejoiced with great rejoicing. Oh, that's just like soul crushing. Because what it means is this. When all of the people experience the mercy of God, Jonah rages. And when Jonah is comfortable by himself, he rejoices. And he's revealing Jonah's heart that what he cares about most is himself. God is, God is lovingly showing Jonah the fact that he is far more concerned with his own physical pleasure than with the spiritual fate of an entire city. That's a devastating commentary on Jonah's selfishness. Now, Sometimes what we desperately need is to have our selfishness exposed. Because if we're being honest, it's like sometimes when you're the most selfish is when you're actually the least aware of how selfish you are. You know what I'm saying? And what you need is to have your selfishness exposed. It made me think of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. You know, the, the character Ebenezer Scrooge. He hates Christmas lights. He is selfish, he's conceited, he's money hungry, he's greedy. He's like this awful figure. And he has an employee whose name is Bob Cratchit. And this employee um, is exploited and mistreated and underpaid by Scrooge. And the result of that is that Bob, who... Bob now doesn't have enough money to take care of his ailing little boy whose name is Tiny Tim. You know Tiny Tim, the little kid on the crutches. He's he's like supposed to be a very sympathetic figure. You're supposed to feel for him. He's sick and he's dying, but his dad doesn't have enough money to take care of him because his employer, Scrooge, won't pay him enough. And Scrooge has more than enough means to rectify this situation and to be helpful, but he refuses to do it because he's so selfish. And in one of the climactic scenes, the ghost of Christmas future shows Scrooge a vision of a time yet to come when Tiny Tim dies and Bob is left in despair because Scrooge was so selfish that he wouldn't help. And here's the point. It wasn't until his selfishness was exposed that he was moved to change. And so sometimes the most loving thing that God can do for you is show you just how ugly your sin is. Now it's uncomfortable, make no mistake, to come face to face with how messed up you can be. That's hard. But what I want you to see is that it is the love and the patience of God that would expose that for you because God never uncovers sin in order to shame you. He only and ever uncovers sin in order to invite you into healing and repentance and forgiveness and change. The reality is that every single one of us is hardwired in our sin nature with a me first mentality my priorities, my desires, my outcomes, my image, my advancement. We're wired like that. But God knows that if you want to live a miserable life, you should make it all about you. 
If you want to, if you want to be unhappy, if you want to be bitter, if you want, if you want to, your life to be small and shallow and angry and fearful, make your life all about you to the detriment of the people around you. God knows that true life, abundant life, is not found in focusing primarily on yourself, but on God and on others. And so he invites you lovingly and patiently, just like he exposes this sinful, stubborn selfishness in Jonah, he wants to expose it in you and me so that he can invite us into something better. This is what he's doing. He's patiently pursuing those who don't share his heart. The second way he does it is he exposes my stubborn selfishness. Here's the third and final way. God pursues me when he identifies my hard heart. He confronts my ridiculous rage. He exposes my stubborn selfishness. And last, he identifies my hard heart. These two questions that are juxtaposed against one another make a, make a powerful point. And in the line of questioning, God is going to identify the state of Jonah's heart based on the things that he cares about, the things that he prioritizes. So verse 10 says, And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. These two questions, when they're held up against one another, what it does is it reveals the fact that Jonah's heart is hard where God's heart is soft. You see, there, there's a lot of destruction talked about in Jonah, that the city is going to be destroyed, that the plant was destroyed. There's, there's destruction, but the only thing that actually gets destroyed in the story is the thing that Jonah loves, which is the plant. Jonah just cares about the plant, and it's the only thing that gets destroyed. Now, the reason that that is worth noting is because conspicuously, the thing that doesn't get destroyed is the thing that God loves which are the people in the city. And he's revealing to Jonah, hey, Jonah, your heart is hard towards the things that I care about. And he's, he's using this question to expose the hardness of Jonah's heart. Because here's what he's saying. He says, Jonah, you are so concerned. You have so much pity. You have so much compassion. You have so much care for this inanimate, insignificant object, a plant, which does not belong to you and did not come from you. It was a gift of my grace that you had it at all in the first place. And you're so concerned with it. This is why he, even, this is why he ends with cattle. God is saying, like, even cows are more important than plants, but they pale in comparison, which the thing with the thing that is most important, which is people. And so he says, Jonah, if you care so much about this plant, don't you think that I should care about the precious people that are made in my image who are lost in sin and desperately in need of my grace? He's saying, Jonah, you care so much about the plant and you care nothing about the people. You've got your heart calloused into stone. This is what he's saying to Jonah. And, and that's like what's going on in Jonah's heart. He's got like calluses. You know, when you do a lot of work with your hands and you, you develop those hard patches of skin that are just unfeeling and insensitive, they, they don't perceive the way that the rest of your hand does. Why? Because they've been, they've been rubbed until they're hardened. And Jonah's heart has a big callus on it. The things that should move him just don't at all. He, he's cold and indifferent towards these hundreds of thousands of image bearers that God really cares about. Now, the question that we should ask ourselves, and, and really I, I think that one of the reasons that the question like hangs in the air, right? He says, shouldn't I have pity on that great city, Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from the left, and even the cows? And the question just like hangs there. It's like it like cuts to black. 
And the question is almost more potent for the fact that it's not answered. You know, it like hangs in the gap there in the silence. And I think one of the reasons is that we don't know what Jonah answered to this question. We have no more biblical data about Jonah at all. We have no idea if he was like, oh God, you're, you're right. I've been missing it. And he repented and his heart was softened and he came back to the Lord. We don't know if that happened or if he just remained in his stubbornness for all of his days. We have no idea. But I think the reason it ends with this hanging question is because far more important than how Jonah responded is how you will respond. The question is supposed to hang because you're the one who's supposed to answer it. I'm the one who's supposed to be confronted by this question. Is my heart hard where God's heart is soft? And this is almost always towards people, right? It's almost never towards things. This is almost always about people. And as humans, we have this tendency to place people for one reason or another in a, in a camp that's outside of our own and to label them with hatred and disgust and distaste rather than compassion and love. And so the question we should be asking as we get to the end of Jonah here is this, who is my heart, who is my heart hard against that God wants my heart to be soft for? Who have I hardened my heart against them? Like, no, not them, just not them, that God actually wants me to be moved in compassion for, that God wants me to care for, that God wants me to love. Because I think it's really easy for us, all of us, to take people for one reason or another because of their socioeconomic status, because of their political affiliation, because of how they choose to live their life, because of their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, their religious background, the neighborhood they grew up in, the schools that they went to, the things that they love, the side of a conflict or a war that they land on. You, go, you name the list of things that you can look at somebody and say, I'm disgusted by those people. And sometimes the people that you look at, even as a Christian, the people that you look at and you think they are the most depraved and they're the most disturbing and they're the most crooked and they're the most twisted and your heart maybe is filled with like a low level hatred for them, those are exactly the people that God's heart is broken for. When he says that these people can't tell their right hand from their left, he's talking about spiritual inability. These people are lost in darkness and they need the grace of God. The reason that Jonah is in your Bible is because God's plan to reach people that are far from him is that the people he's already reached would have a soft heart for them. You know what I mean? God has reached you so you can reach them. God has rescued you so that you can offer rescue to them. This is one of the reasons that you're still on planet earth and not in the presence of God because he's not done saving people and he wants to use you to do it. Now, in order to have a soft heart, we need to be well aware of how powerful the grace of God has been in our lives. Jonah his character is like in perfect harmony with another character in the Bible. It, it rhymes perfectly with another character. <clears throat> you guys remember the story of the prodigal son where the young man takes his inheritance early from his father, goes to a faraway land, and dishonors his father and his family by squandering the inheritance, living a licentious, wicked, rebellious lifestyle. And he finds himself at the very bottom of the pit in the pigsty. And in his humiliation, he decides that he will crawl home and beg for grace from his father. But the power of the prodigal son's story is that the father doesn't just reluctantly receive him back into the family. He sees him from a far way off and he goes running out to embrace him. He wraps the best robe around him. He slaughters the fattened calf and they throw a rager to celebrate that my son who once was lost has now been found. It's, a, it's an incredible story of the loving kindness and mercy and grace of God. And you would expect at the end of the story, it's like the son got home and everyone threw the party and everyone celebrated and the curtain closes and the story's over. But that's not how the prodigal son ends either. Do you remember? There's another character, the older brother, 
who, while everyone else in the family is celebrating the mercy of the father, he is out on the porch and he is enraged that his scumbag of a little brother who didn't deserve it got the love and kindness of his dad. Jonah's in the Bible so that we will not be the older brother. The reason that the older brother did that is because he forgot how kind the father had been to him. He forgot the mercy that he received. He forgot that it was an undeserved gift that he was loved. And so he didn't think anyone else should be loved either. And I just hope and pray that we'll be the kind of church whose heart breaks for people who need God's grace because we remember that God has given us grace. If we remember that God went to such great lengths to love us that he sent his very own son who died to pay the penalty of my sin, was in the deep like Jonah for three days and came out victorious with a message of salvation for anyone who would trust in the name of the Lord, if we remember that that was God's pursuit of us, we will joyfully participate in his pursuit of others. May our hearts be soft. May we remember the grace that we have received and may we eagerly participate in the loving pursuit of God for a world that desperately needs to know him. Let's pray.